some breaking news. A mass shooting in southwest Philadelphia overnight. We know at least nine people were shot, including four of them juveniles. And authorities do say that one of these victims has died. Hey, yeah, I just want to start it off by, you know, saying I'm just super grateful. I can't even really put into too many words like... Um, like it's like an old science fiction movie, but a study out of Harvard finds that aliens might be living among us. I'm not sure what kind of Pandora's box you opened, but when it comes to this paper, I got... And new tonight, a low country man is dead after police say he put a large firework device on his head and ignited it. According to the Dorchester County Coroner's Office, the incident happened on Cottonwood Drive around 10 p.m. last night. According to the incident report, the man's wife says that he started drinking around 6 p.m. yesterday, and now she tried to tell him not to do it. The victim, 41-year-old Alan McGrew, was pronounced dead around 11 p.m. last night. The coroner, along with the Dorchester County Sheriff's Office are still investigating this incident. I had a chance to talk to Dorchester County Coroner Paul Brothers about what was an easily preventable tragedy. Approximately 10:20 last night, we received a call, or, or the Sheriff's Department and EMS received a call about a, an injury suffered by an individual while engaging in uh, shooting fireworks. This happened on Cottonwood Drive in the Crestwood subdivision. The man who was involved in this incident was 41-year-old Alan Ray McGrew. There was nothing emergency crews could do to help him when they arrived. He was pronounced dead at 11.10 p.m. Well, according to witnesses and family members at the scene, the decedent was standing in the roadway on Cottonwood Drive and had on a large top hat and put the firework device on top of that, uh, lit it, put it on top of his head, and it exploded, and uh, he suffered a massive head injury. The police report says McGrew started drinking at 6 p.m., and his wife tried to get him to not put the firework on his head, but she said he was trying to show off. These kinds of incidents are 100% preventable as you know unfortunately some bad judgment was used in this case and we're certainly sorry for that and we're certainly send our sympathies to the family of this individual Firework debris is littered throughout this northwest side alley. A 4th of July family tradition turned tragic when fireworks killed 34-year-old Earl Laurie, a father of two young children with a third on the way. He, he went light it up, but he went down like this, straight to the fire. But then when he light it up, he take too long to back up. And the thing blow, I mean, hit him right in the face. Lori died instantly in front of his family. His mother tells us he was a great son who always helped her. Firework remnants were not just in the alley, but in nearby streets in the Belmont Gardens neighborhood. Residents say several people were setting fireworks off all night. It's a terrible tragedy, and I'm, I feel so sorry for the people around and his family, but I think that it, there's so many people doing it. You're doing it over and over again. There's bound to be an accident. They're explosives. For the Chicago Fire Department, it was a busy night all over the city. Two homes went up in flames in Inglewood, sparked by fireworks. In addition, multiple garages, garbage cans, porches, and other kinds of property were damaged. Citywide, there was an overwhelming response to the fireworks in Chicago. I think at the minimum, we have 13 confirmed fireworks-related fires, and that's just a conservative estimate at this point. That, that number will increase over time as the reporting comes in. CFD says it was the most fires caused by fireworks in at least 20 years. Years. Fortunately, no one was severely injured in the fires. And though fireworks are illegal in Chicago, they are easily accessible over state lines. 
And while it was a busy 4th of July for the Chicago Fire Department, CFD expects more fireworks to be blown off this weekend. And officials cannot stress enough that accidents are 100% preventable. Grieving parents demanding justice for their daughter. The police found Dr. Diamond Clark's body last week at a park in Lithonia. Investigators made this heartbreaking discovery less than a month after Clark graduated from the Morehouse School of Medicine. Atlanta News first reporter Brittany Ford is outside Morehouse School of Medicine tonight. Brittany, family members, they're desperate. Understandably, they want to find out how Clark died. Well, this family is completely devastated. I was able to speak with a longtime friend of Clark who says the circumstances surrounding her death aren't adding up. Authorities say 28-year-old Dr. Diamond Clark was last seen here at her Decatur home on May 28th. We received a crash alert from her phone. Darren Anglin is one of Clark's longtime friends. Talk to me about how you felt when you heard that news. In shock. Authorities discovered her body with a gunshot wound to the head a day later in this wooded area in Lithonia. And her car was also found abandoned nearby. Police say her cell phone was later recovered in the driveway of her home. We, we want to better understand, you know, you know, who, who may be the owner of the gun, um, you know, how the gun was discharged. Police records state her boyfriend was the last to see Clark. In a statement to police, he claims the two got into an argument at the home and that Clark left and never returned. From our seat, we can only see that she had to have been taken from us. The 28-year-old was a Morehouse Medical School graduate, UGA alumnus, and a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Cell phone video captures a recent tribute to Clark at the Megan the Stallion concert at State Farm Arena. Algen says they're demanding police conduct a thorough investigation. And now that she's gone, the family is looking for justice for this woman who dedicated her entire life to seeking justice and life for others. The DeKalb County Police say Clark's death appears to be a suicide. However, the cause of death will be determined by the medical examiner's office once an autopsy report is complete. In West Atlanta, Brittany Ford. Atlanta News. Sounds like an old science fiction movie, but a study out of Harvard finds that aliens might be living among us. I'm not sure what kind of Pandora's box you opened, but when it comes to this paper, I gotta ask, what do you what do you think about your peers, uh, what they're writing over at Harvard there? The fascinating part of that to me is that it would just went literally out of my head. Harvard University's Human Flourishing Program speculates UFOs may be spaceships visiting alien friends planted on Earth, planted right here on Earth, that is. Those aliens then are disguised as humans trying to fit in. They were just at the beach. <laughs> Those aliens just saw the beach. They're living yeah. among us. Yep, yep, they are. And well, I guess what got me interested in this is how often these beings are described as looking just like that. Um, we're sort of at the point where we can't just talk about the craft any longer. Right. But we also have to acknowledge that there are seemingly an intelligent um, group of individuals, species that are piloting these things wow. and are ubiquitously described as looking just like us. You weren't crazy if you saw this in the sky last night. A lot of you called us today. This is our friend Mike Kristen up in Moon Valley, and he got it all on tape last night between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. Take a look. Seven lights, almost real, actually hovering really low over the valley. I'm told that at least one traffic controller saw the lights. They were reported by at least one commercial airline pilot. But John and Marlene, nothing showed up on radar. Nothing showed up on radar? Nothing. Hmm. All right. A mystery. Then still, Jim, thank you. You're welcome. I was going to say, it sounded like some type of military aircraft. That's what we were thinking until show we said radar, that. Now you've got me wondering. You may be able to help me in this oh, more yeah. who knows? Because this is an international story. Because of you both being here, I looked into the international files. Not covered by our Ministry of Defense, but maybe covered by yours. This took place in Arizona. An unidentified pilot, according to the press cuttings, flying near an airport in Arizona with his son when he spotted six lights in the night sky. So he called from the airplane to air traffic control to say, I'm seeing these lights here. I wasn't expecting any other planes. They're none supposed to be on my landing path. Can you tell me what's going on? They said there are no other planes. He said, I'm seeing six bright lights coming towards me. Mystery unresolved. 
Except, oh. tail number for that plane was Bonanza 2 Tango Sierra, and I was the pilot. No, no way. We are speaking with the U.S. Marshals Service about a major nationwide operation that helped rescue 200 missing children in the span of just six weeks. Many of these kids vulnerable to sex trafficking and exploitation. And one child was found here in Jacksonville on the west side, according to a local spokesperson. This video was taken by U.S. Marshals in Miami during Operation We Will Find You Too. We were building off of the success of the operation we had last year, this We Will Find You. What we do as an agency is we, we try to focus our efforts on high-risk missing children that don't normally get a lot of law enforcement attention. Over a six-week period that ended in late June, the U.S. Marshals, in collaboration with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and help from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, targeted areas with high clusters of missing children. We are focusing our efforts on primarily the high-risk runaways. These kids that are running away from foster care or group homes or bad family situations, and they're out on the street and they're vulnerable. Of the 200 who were found during this operation, 173 were endangered runaways, and more than half were removed from dangerous situations, according to the U.S. Marshals Service. And within 24 hours, within a day or so of being on the street, there are adults approaching them, encouraging them either into trafficking or other criminal activity that's you know just as dangerous. Bill Bolden, senior inspector with the U.S. Marshals, describes the number of missing children in the U.S. as astronomical. On a given day, there are an average of 37,000 juveniles who are sitting in the national database having at some time been reported as missing. What this tells us is if we can find 200 in this short time span with the very, very limited resources that we have, how many more we could find if we had even more resources. Now, once children are rescued, he says that the goal is to get them the aftercare they need to prevent them from running away again. And I do want to point out, 77 of the kids that were found were said to be in safe locations, according to law enforcement and child welfare agencies. Remember this, three years after this botched detonation of illegal fireworks in South L.A., relief is finally coming for displaced residents. The city council has approved a new multi-million dollar settlement for residents forced from their homes. Fox 11's Matthew Seedorf live outside the the hotel tonight where many of those residents have been living for years. Matthew. That's right, Alex Christine. Those residents are smiling tonight. They've been living at this hotel for about three years with an uncertain future. That future now becoming a lot more clear. That measure is agreed to. L.A. City Council Tuesday approving a new $21 million settlement for those jolted by LAPD's botched handling of illegal fireworks now three years ago. It's sad that it took this long, but we're glad that the council unanimously decided to do that. June 2021, LAPD's bomb squad ignited this massive explosion of illegal fireworks on 27th Street. 17 people injured, 35 buildings damaged, dozens of residents displaced, including Maria Velasquez. I wish I could have smiled more, but I'm happy. I'm really happy for my family. I'm really happy for everybody in 27. For the last three years, Maria, her family, and others have been living at this hotel in downtown L.A. It's nice to be in a hotel, but birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, holidays, everything is awful. It's not... We can't even call this our home. The new $21 million settlement includes housing at the hotel until February and $848,000 towards a new community fund. It's unclear how the $21 million will be distributed. Some people are going to think $20 million of taxpayer money, that's too much. Some people are going to think $20 million of taxpayer money, that's too much. We absolutely agree. And the $10 million that has already been spent that could have been used already to repair their homes. But the city council and the mayor dragged their feet on this issue, and that ended up costing the taxpayers way more money that was, than, you know, than was necessary. Was the L.A. City Councilman Curran Price admits the process has been agonizingly slow. Adding the incident should never have happened and was entirely preventable, LAPD has learned from this disaster and has taken every necessary step to prevent such tragedies from occurring ever again. Happy to know that it's finally, finally Finally, after three years of fighting for it, it's finally coming. America's new race into space 
with spin launch. The problem with getting things into orbit has always been the rocket equation. That is, the vast majority of what it takes to get a rocket beyond our atmosphere is fuel, more than 90% of it. But what if, in fact, most of that fuel is not actually needed? I think it's gonna be 105 today. Welcome to the high desert of New Mexico. In a remote valley of New Mexico, beyond gates that look like they're straight out of a science fiction movie, an object that seems like alien technology towers above the terrain. 2.2 million tons of steel and a little bit taller than the Statue of Liberty. That's right. This is A33, short for Accelerator 33. And it's the world's largest diameter vacuum chamber. So it's the brainchild of Jonathan Yaney, founder and CEO of Spin Launch. So we're standing here underneath the vacuum chamber. This is the main launch vehicle loading door. Okay. One of the really interesting features about this particular system is that it's on hydraulics and the entire system can rotate. Yaney's company has been at it since 2014, but most of the construction on this project took place during the COVID years. It's an idea designed for a new space age that relies on a concept that dates back to the Stone Age, the sling. This is essentially a sling launch system, which you know we were using to hunt with 50,000 years ago. It's, it's simply using modern materials uh, and encased in, in a large vacuum chamber. So what you have is you have an arm that you know, slowly rotates around and around, driven by an electric motor. And once the tip velocity is sufficient for uh, it to be able to carry a spacecraft into space, we simply let go. And it travels outside of the vacuum chamber through the atmosphere in about 30 seconds into space. The sling in this case is a carbon fiber tether, which spins the launch vehicle or projectile until it hits 5,000 miles an hour sending it through an airtight membrane hurtling towards space and eliminating the need to lift all that fuel used in traditional rockets. Launching in three, two, one. All new forms of transportation usually seem kind of crazy, whether it's a suspension bridge, a train, an aeroplane, you know, even the automobile. And we arrive at these new innovative methods through the process of experimentation. To reach the necessary speed, the tether has to operate in a vacuum. Over here, you have a bank of low vacuum mechanical pumps, which extract the sort of first amount of air. And then you have the very, very large high vacuum pump which uses an entirely different type of non-mechanical process to extract the remaining molecules of air out of the chamber, allowing you to achieve high vacuum, which allows us to go hypersonic speeds here at sea level. So you have zero air in there when it's launched? About one one-thousandth of atmosphere, correct. Yaney was inspired in part by a 1960s U.S. military program that tried using very large guns to send projectiles into space. The program was eventually abandoned. But Yaney's been obsessed with all things aeronautic since he was a kid, including flying. I was sitting on my mom's lap when I was like three years old, holding the controls, like learning how to fly. So I've kind of been flying in Cessna's my whole life. On some level, you, you know, flying in the sky, you look up to space, you know, what else is there? And I think it always bugged me that we went to the moon, you know, but then we, we like stopped. We just sort of never went back. It's like we were, you know, as, as a civilization, we were promised that we were going to have all of this expansion to space, and that just, it just proved to be astronomically expensive. I would love it if we could just give them some wind. Maybe, I mean, you can knock them over, that's fine too, if you want to. <laughs> Welcome to the belly of the beast. Yaney took us inside the launcher. From here we climb to see the motor that provides the circulating force, or torque. So this entire shaft is spinning into the vacuum chamber, and there's a seal around it which prevents the air, the passage of air around it. So it is a relatively straightforward industrial system that combine <laughs> relatively straightforward <laughs> to create something truly, truly unique. Team Jonathan here, go ahead and begin the test rotation now. 
fast is this shaft spinning? Yeah, this shaft will spin at about 1,200 RPM here in this test facility. So again, fast, but quite a bit slower than your automobile, for example. Huh. Which brings us back to the projectiles, which will eventually be used to transport satellites and much needed equipment into space. Some breaking news, a mass shooting in Southwest Philadelphia overnight. We know at least nine people were shot, including four of them juveniles, and authorities do say that one of these victims has died. Action News reporter Catherine Scott is live at police headquarters with the latest on what we know. Good morning. Good morning, Tam. That's right. Nine people were shot. One of them died. Detectives here at the Homicide Division continue to investigate, trying to determine exactly what happened. We're still waiting for confirmation on the conditions of the rest of the victims. Let's go to video from Southwest Philadelphia. You can see the fireworks going off over the crime scene at 60th and King Sessing for the 4th of July. Shell casings on the street. The crime scene spanning roughly two blocks with multiple vehicles hit by gunfire. We're told there were some cookouts going on in the area, but it's unclear if this occurred at one of them. Around 11:30. 30 p.m. officers on routine patrol found someone lying on the ground. They realized they'd been shot and called it in. More victims were then discovered by responding officers. Other victims showed up at hospitals. In all, five adults and four juveniles were shot. One person died. We're told the juveniles are around 16 or 17 years old. So far, police have not released a description of who could be behind this and why. The search for the person or people responsible continues this morning. At this point, there's no motive whatsoever that we're aware of right now. We have various crowds that are gathering here where we uh, officers broke through those crowds up during the course of the evening, and we don't know if, they, if, if some type of argument broke out during those crowds or not. No weapons were recovered. Call police with any tips. The investigation. Here's what we can tell you. One person was killed, 20 years old. He was rushed to the hospital, pronounced dead. This happened last night, South Salford Street, but Before near where they are now. Let's I listen. say anything about the facts of last night's mass shooting in this community and before any broader thoughts, I want to say something to the people of King Sessing. the trauma that you are feeling right now it's not normal and you shouldn't have to get used to it I don't want you to think that we in this city are ever going to get used to it each and every one of you in this community the mothers the fathers the daughters the sons the grandfathers and grandmothers who are raising grandchildren in this neighborhood, doing the best they can with what they have to try to ensure that their, their young people, their families are living the best quality of life as possible. This is not normal. <laughs> with the 108th pick in the 2024 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Jackson, defensive back, Oregon. They said the front board. Hey, yeah, I just want to start it off by, you know, saying I'm just super grateful. I can't even really put into too many words like, um, like this, how this process has really truthfully been. It's just been a, a really a whirlwind. Um, I had a feeling uh, Minnesota was going to uh, be getting me. It was one of the teams that I built one of the strongest connections with throughout this process. Uh, you know, talk with Quazy, you know, Coach Jones. We had a good relationship. He's from my hometown, actually. And um, Coach O'Connell. Uh, it's just, I'm just looking forward to, you know, making my impact out here. Um, that's just what I'm most looking forward to. They took a chance on me, you know, regardless of some of the um, things they might have heard. And I just feel like I can't thank them enough. And I'm just looking forward to making, you know, Viking Nation proud. Minnesota Vikings rookie cornerback Kyrie Jackson is dead following a car accident in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, early Saturday morning. Two other people were also killed. Maryland State Police say three vehicles were involved in the crash, and they also say the driver of a silver Infinity first struck the Dodge Charger that Jackson and the other two victims were in, then struck a Chevy Impala. Jackson and the driver of the Charger were pronounced dead at the scene, and the third passenger was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. Jackson 
Jackson was 24 years old. Investigators believe alcohol and speed may have been contributing factors, but the crash remains under investigation. Jackson was selected in the fourth round of the 2024 NFL Draft. In college, he played for the University of Oregon and the University of Alabama. force of the crash was evident. The toll in human life, a heavy one. Three people who were in this Dodge Charger were killed around 3.15 this morning northbound Route 4 near Dower House Road in Upper Marlboro. According to state police, the Charger was struck by a woman driving the Silver Infinity as she tried to change lanes while traveling at a high rate of speed. The car also struck a Chevy Impala whose lone occupant, the driver, was not injured. The preliminary investigation shows the Charger went off the road into several tree stumps and ended up on a service road adjacent to the highway. The driver was 23-year-old Isaiah Hazel of Upper Marlboro. 24-year-old Kyrie Jackson of Waldorf was the front seat passenger. Both died at the scene. 24-year-old Anthony Litton, a back seat passenger, died later at a hospital. All three were former football players at Wise High School. Kyrie Jackson was a rookie cornerback for the Minnesota Vikings. He always had high expirations. His grandfather, Anthony Jackson, was among the friends and family members of the victims who came to the scene. His grandfather recalls how proud they all were of Kyrie Jackson's achievements. Do what the best that he could possibly do in, in, in life and with the family. Jackson, Isaiah Hazel, and Anthony Litton were graduates of Henry J. Wise High School in Upper Marlboro, and all three were part of state championship teams. They were still together still hanging out, still doing some things together. Westlake High School football coach DeLon Parrish coached all three of the young men when he was at Henry Wise High School. He also taught all three of them. Isaiah had an infectious, infectious attitude. Um, he was extraordinary. Uh, everybody loved being around him. AJ, phenomenal athlete. You know, he could do anything he wanted. Kyrie, belief in himself um, was incredible. And he adds, he was inspired by the three young men, and they'll continue to inspire others. As police began their investigation into the deadly crash, loved ones of the victims began to deal with the loss. We're going to try to, to get through this as best as we possibly can. The driver of the third vehicle that was struck was uninjured. State police say the driver of the Infinity, identified as 23-year-old Corey Klingman, and two passengers in her car were also uninjured. Create an omnipresent video surveillance network. The Shuelian, or Sharp Eyes project, aims to extend and integrate video surveillance from cities into villages and from roads into residential compounds. It aims to use artificial intelligence, big data, and deep learning to analyze this mountain of video evidence, to work out who's doing what, where, and when, to track suspects and the people they associate with, and even to predict crime. In November, I visited three tech companies in the cities of Beijing and Chongqing to see how China plans to make the communist slogan, the masses have sharp eyes, into a reality. Here are a few of the ideas that the tech companies showcased. These cameras are looking at a road junction and they're identifying everything that's passing through. They're looking at cars, reading the number plates, and they're looking at pedestrians, classifying pedestrians according to their age, their gender, what kind of clothes they're wearing, even what kind of hairstyles they have. This software analyzes crowds. It's producing a heat map of where people are massing together, the sort of thing you might use to prevent overcrowding. And you can also see that it's also able to track individuals through the crowd. So if you're looking for a suspect this is the kind of software you might want to use here we can see two cameras picking faces out of the crowd comparing those faces to a national database of suspects of wanted men and women the police then look at the matches that are flagged and see whether they think that's someone they're looking for they can then swoop in to potentially arrest or question the person that the cameras have identified 
a completely different application now. This camera is trained on the face of a truck driver. It's looking at his facial expressions and what he's doing to see whether he's showing any signs of tiredness. If the score rises above a certain level, then he's seen as too tired to drive. His company will be alerted. They'll give him a call and tell him to take a rest. The Sharp Eyes project has already been rolled out in more than 50 cities. So far, the tech doesn't quite match the ambition, but experts agree that facial recognition is improving fast and is a technology of the future. Concerns are being raised about whether the system will be used in China to unfairly target ethnic minorities or be used as a way to crack down on dissidents and activists. But in the tech startups that I visited, the young elite staff seemed cheerfully unaware of those kind of concerns. Ukraine is on the back foot on the front lines. The Russian forces continue to inch forward pretty much every day, despite the delivery of the much-promised Western weapon systems to the Ukrainian forces. It doesn't seem to be having any effect in halting the Russian advance. The long-awaited F-16s are due to arrive in Kiev in a few weeks from now. And today, Germany announced it has given yet another Patriot missile defense system. But the tide seems to be slowly changing in Moscow's favor. In a bit of a startling world face, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has extended, extended an olive branch to Moscow. He's inviting Russian representatives to attend the next peace summit without any preconditions. This dramatic shift comes just mere weeks after Zelensky's adamant stance that it can talk of truce only if Russia relinquishes the occupied Ukrainian territories. Simultaneously in a calculated move, the Russian President Vladimir Putin met with the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban in Moscow. Putin said that he is ready to discuss the nuances of the Ukraine conflict but has demanded for the total withdrawal of all Ukrainian troops from the four regions that have been annexed by Russia. And all this diplomatic maneuvering is taking place against the backdrop of the increasing Russian military pressure at the Ukrainian strategic retreats. As Kiev grapples with mounting challenges on the battlefield, its forces find themselves on the back foot in the strategically crucial town of Chasavyar. The Ukrainian military has acknowledged a partial withdrawal from its eastern Donetsk stronghold facing relentless Russia's scorched earth tactics that are aimed at obliterating potential defensive positions. Adding to the tension, Russia's defense ministry drills are also underway involving mobile nuclear missile launchers, a clear demonstration of Moscow's nuclear capabilities. And this follows the recent tactical nuclear exercises further ratcheting up the stakes in the conflict. The Russian forces also claim some significant strikes against the Ukrainian military assets, including the destruction of tanks at the U.S.-made Havitzers and MiG-29 fighter jets. Moreover, Moscow claims successful attacks on many military enterprises, oil refineries and also drone production facilities, potentially crippling Ukraine's logistical and industrial capabilities. And also drone production facilities, potentially crippling Ukraine's logistical and industrial capabilities. Well, Mark, that's right. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's wife, Alina Zelenska, is allegedly the first owner of a Bugatti Tourbillon, that is the brand new Bugatti model that costs four and a half million euros. Now Bystanders intervention might have put an end to a deadly shooting July 4th at a Fort Worth car wash before it could get even worse. Court documents for the arrest of 27-year-old Kennard Murphy outline how the shooting started and how it came to an end. Three people were killed, two young girls, as well as 42-year-old Terrell Wynn. Fox News' Amelia Jones spoke with Wynn's family, joins us with new details on the investigation. Amelia. Blake, uh, those three victims were not involved in the initial fight. As you mentioned, those victims include two young girls and 42-year-old Terrell Wynn. I spoke to his sister today, who told me that the family is still in shock about what happened. Fort Worth police say this car wash off West Cleburne Road in Fort Worth is where a large 4th of July gathering ended in gunfire. According to court documents, 27-year-old Kennard Murphy went to this gathering to see his 11-month-old daughter. Witnesses told police due to prior domestic violence issues between Murphy and the baby's mother, there are relatives in her family who don't like him. Just before midnight, one of those relatives got in a fight with Murphy. At 
first, it appeared the two men were going to get in a fist fight. Then Murphy pulled out a rifle and started shooting at the other man, who was unarmed. Three people not involved in the fight were hit by gunfire. Like, life is so unfair. It's so unfair. And it be the innocent people that get hurt. Twyla Wynn's brother, 42-year-old Terrell Wynn, was one of the three people shot. He was hit in the leg and died from his injuries. Bullets also struck the back of a vehicle and hit two sisters in the back seat. One-year-old Winter Thuston and four-year-old Ivy Pierce. The children were taken to the hospital and later died. And them babies didn't deserve it. My brother didn't deserve it. The documents go on to say an unknown person shot Murphy in the back, forcing him to drop the rifle. Then another person rushed over to grab it before Murphy could get to it and continue shooting. So I just hate he was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wynn couldn't confirm if her brother knew anyone at the large gathering. She believes he was there to use the car wash. Wynn says her brother moved to Texas from Louisiana about five years ago for a better life. He was going to celebrate his 43rd birthday in two weeks. His sister says that he also leaves behind a 21-year-old son. He's going to always hold a special place in my heart. When police spoke to Murphy, they said that he admitted to pointing the rifle at the relative of his baby's mother who he was fighting with, and he admitted to police, they say, that he tried to shoot him. Tonight, one woman is dead and three others hurt after a shootout between neighbors on Indies near Northwest Side. Fox 59's Jesse Wells spoke to some of those neighbors and explains what they claim led to the violence. Cell phone video shown to me by a neighbor clearly shows the man who lives in this home standing at his front door and firing the first shot into a crowd of people next door. Those victims then return fire, leading to a shootout that left one woman dead. Just before 9.30 Thursday night, a 4th of July celebration led to a dispute between neighbors that erupted into gunfire. I'm frustrated because this could have been avoided. Like, this didn't have to happen. That woman asked not to be identified, but police reports show she called officers to the scene more than an hour before the shooting and claimed her neighbor threatened her family with a gun because they were setting off fireworks. He said, if you keep lighting those fireworks, I'm going to shoot something over there. That's what he said. After police left, video shows the suspect shoot into a crowd of neighbors who shot back, shattering the glass on the suspect's front door. The suspect then went inside and allegedly continued to shoot out the side window as his neighbors returned fire. 48-year-old Heather Walters, who was inside the suspect's home, was killed in that crossfire. I mean, what do you think is going to occur on July 4th? People are going to use fireworks. That is no reason to get into disturbance and end up shooting at your neighbors. It's senseless. It makes no logical sense. It's frustrating, it's sad, and it's sick altogether because it could have been avoided a long time ago. That woman's two sons were shot in the face and leg but survived. Police reports confirm she called police multiple times in recent months to report issues with the same neighbor. I have numerous amount of reports and calls on him for basically the same thing. They come out and they do nothing. The neighbor who fired the first shot was hospitalized and faces possible criminal charges. So far, no other arrests have been made. Finally, the case does remain an active investigation. Anyone with additional information to share can contact either IMPD's homicide office or Crime Stop. On a scale of one to five with an airplane light being maybe two, these are four and a half at least. With an Air Force base nearby, many assume the lights were burning flares suspended from parachutes, but the military says it had only routine fighter flights flying that night and no flares. Some, like Tim and Bobby Lee, claim they saw even more. Something was there. It was a structure. It was going 35 miles an hour. It was huge. It didn't make a sound. And uh, you tell me what can do that. And we have checked into it. We called the FAA, Sky Harbor Airport, and Luke Air Force Base for some kind of an explanation as to these strange lights. And so far, we have nothing. Paul and Robin. Phil, you said over the last 10 years there's been a lot of significant sightings across the country. When was the last one here in the southwest? Well, according to uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, about two weeks ago, they say there was a series of four golden disks or flying saucers that were hovering just above Phoenix. That's the first I've heard of it. All right, well, we'll be keeping our eyes up on the sky. A little spooky that they couldn't find it on radar. The lights traveled close to 200 miles 
in about 40 minutes. Even a commercial airline pilot here at Sky Harbor Airport reported seeing the lights last night. He radioed the tower just after takeoff, telling them that the object was directly above him. That means that air traffic controllers in the tower should have picked the object up on their radar screens. And yet they say they saw nothing. I was flying him to go see his girlfriend. And uh, we we're on approach. And uh, I saw six lights over the airport in absolute uniform in a V shape. And I, and Oliver said to me, I was just looking at him and I was coming in. We're maybe a half a mile out. And Oliver said, Pa, do you, what, is, what are those lights? And I, and I, then it kind of like came out of my <clears throat> reverie and, and I said, I don't know what they are. I said, uh, uh, he said, are we okay here? And I said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call him. And I reported it. And they said, we're not painting anything. We don't show anything. I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to declare it's unidentified. It's flying and it's six objects. Mm -hmm. We landed. I taxied, dropped him off, took off, went back to L.A. Never said a word. He never said a word. I never thought of it. Two years later, Goldie is watching a television show when I came home. Yeah. And the show is on UFOs. But as I'm, I'm, I came home, hey, honey, how's it going? And I'm kind of hearing this t the TV going, and I stopped, and I started watching, and it was on that event. Now, that was the most, um, that was the most viewed UFO event. Over 20,000 people saw that. Now, that was the most, um, that was the most viewed UFO event. Over 20,000 people saw that. A murder at Lenox Square is now solved. Today, a judge sentenced the man responsible to life without parole. It's more time than the prosecution requested. The murder happened in 2020, and it was all over a parking spot. New at 6, Channel 2 investigative reporter Mark Winnie is live inside the Fulton County Courthouse. And Mark, the judge called this an execution. Yeah, a prosecutor here at the Fulton County District Attorney's Office says he used a big diagram of the Lenox Square parking lot along with mall surveillance video and much more to explain to the jury what happened. He says the incident ended in the parking lot with a murder, but it started there too with what should have been a minor dispute over a parking spot. On the count of murder, um, I want to sentence you to life without a possibility of parking lot and a life lost. On March 8, 2020, um, defendant Ricky Lafarge shot and killed Tuan Nguyen in the back of the head in the parking lot of Lenox Mall uh, all over a dispute uh, over a parking spot. Chief Senior Assistant Fulton County DA John Whitenauer says he recommended life, but because of his age at the time of the murder, 19, and his lack of an adult criminal record with the possibility of parole plus five years for Ricky Lafarge. But Judge Alice Benton exceeded that, ordering life without parole, plus five. Someone lost their life over a parking space. Holding us for WCPO 9 News on the Saturday night, I'm Brett Pekanski, and we begin with that breaking news out of Florence that's been developing all day. Four people are dead, three others are in the hospital after they got shot around two o'clock this morning. This happened during a 21st birthday party. Florence police confirmed the shooter died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Here are the names of the victims. 20-year-old Shane Miller from Florence. 20-year-old Hayden Rabicki from Elsmere. 19-year-old Delaney Erie from Burlington. And 44-year-old Melissa Parrott. The three other people injured are expected to survive, but police have not identified them. All of them attended that party at a home on Ridgecrest Drive. And we have our team coverage tonight. Our Sean Delancey and Anna Azalian are standing by as we're starting to know more about the victims from their neighbors and friends. So we're going to start with you, Sean. Walk us through the latest in this investigation. Yeah, Brett, a little over 12 hours since that gunman shot and killed four people and injured three others inside of this home along Ridgecrest Drive. Florence police have wrapped up the bulk of their initial investigation. Uh, they have cleared the roadway, and now the home is the only thing left wrapped in crime scene tape. Florence Police Chief Jeff Mallory says right around 2.30 a.m. they got multiple calls of an active shooter at this birthday party in a home along Ridgecrest. Neighbors describe a scene of people scrambling, jumping over fences, running for their lives. 
Mallory says that a man later identified as Chase Garvey came to the party uninvited and opened fire. As po uh, police arrived on scene, Mallory says that they could still hear gunfire, but Garvey left before they could stop him. Mallory says the first officers on scene immediately began rendering life-saving aid to anyone they could and ended up transporting three people to the hospital in critical condition. Did we train on this, hoping that it would never happen, but unfortunately, we've been touched like so many other departments and cities throughout the nation. And our, our training for our guys and men and women really kicked in and they did an exceptional job. Now, Mallory says that arriving officers spotted Garvey's car taking off from the scene and began chasing him from Route 42 onto Hicks Pike. There, he says Garvey shot himself with his gun and then crashed the car. The suspected gunman was taken to St. Elizabeth, where he died. Now, there is a lot of speculation at this point circulating around the neighborhood as to what caused this shooting to happen. But Mallory says right now, at this point, uh, the motive is still under investigation. Uh, Sean, we know it's been an emotional day in Florence and for much of the tri-state. You were at the news conference today, and you heard Chief Mallory get emotional. You hear it in his voice, and you asked him about that. Yeah, Brett, I've, I've probably been to more, more than a thousand press conferences uh, with police officers at this point. And uh, I, one thing that I noticed during the press conference is that you could definitely hear the emotion in Chief Mallory's voice. The first question I asked, the first question uh, overall, was why he was feeling this one in particular. He says that mass shootings are not something that they deal with in Florence. They've seen it elsewhere, but not here, and that does make it different here. Uh, he says that the emotion that he's feeling right now is for the victim, uh, for the victim's friends and family, and for the officers that have had to go through this. He says that they will be doing everything they can to support all of them. Good Sunday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Lexi Birmingham with the News 5. First alert storm team with an update on the tropics. And the only storm we have our eyes on is, of course, Tropical Storm Barrel. Now, it is starting to look a little bit more organized now, but this is pretty much what we were expecting to happen. Max winds are now up to 65 miles per hour as it's moving to the northwest at 10 miles per hour. Now, we're still expecting Barrel to strengthen back to a Category 1 hurricane, most likely by this evening, but before making landfall along the Texas coast as we head into your Monday morning. And then eventually, as it continues to move further inland, it will start to weaken back down to an area of low pressure and eventually curve its way to the north and northeast. Now that we are less than 24 hours away from that landfall along the Texas coast, a lot of the watches that were issued have now been upgraded to warnings. Now the red color you see on your screen, that is a hurricane warning, which includes areas like Corpus Christi, Victoria, and Lake Jackson. And then we also have tropical storm warnings in place for areas like Houston and Bryan, all the way to the southern tip of Texas, and even a very small portion of the coast of Louisiana. We also have storm surge warnings in place, stretching from Corpus Christi all the way towards Beaumont, Texas, because that specific area could see storm surge up to about six feet. But you'll notice that portions of the southern tip of Texas and parts of the Louisiana coast could also see some storm surge up to about three feet. Now, we here along the Gulf Coast are not going to see any direct impacts from Barrel, and, but we have, over the last couple of days, seen some indirect impacts, including a higher risk for rip currents along our immediate coastline. So again, if you're heading down to the beaches for today, it's going to be highly recommended you stay out of the water as red flags will be flying. Heading down to the beaches for today, it's going to be highly recommended you stay out of the water as red flags will be flying.